Here, let's get some music going here. Let's see, we're getting people to come in here. Uh, thank you for the comments here. Um, man, there's all kinds of good stuff coming on here. Now, I have to, uh, wow, lots of people. Um, let's see, so these questions are great that are coming in. I'm, uh, there's a few questions I need to answer for my class, and also I hope <laughs> they're joining the live stream here. Um, a few folks on here. So I'm going to get that kind of queued up and ready to go, and uh, we'll see if, if they join. And then if not, we'll answer your questions. So mm -hmm. um, so listen to the music as, uh, as we get going here. Let's see here. Thirty-five folks here now. Here we go. <coughs> so we'll get the the Pixies play us here a little bit more. So let's get started. Um, right. So before we get started, I'll answer this question from Rihanna. Rihanna, is, so I have a test I'm giving, a test this afternoon for my students. And so they, they're a little bit uh, um, got testy type questions. So we'll answer Rihanna's question here really quick before I jump in. She says, how accurate do you want our cross sections and graphs, straight edges, all dimensions? She's talking about like how clean do we want everything? Well, I need to be able to read it, I need to be able to understand it. And so you know, do your best, but, um, you know, also finish in time. And how many times do you want iterations if we have to require it? So just like we said in class, if you can be within uh, one KSI, usually you only iterate when you do the double reinforced sections, then uh, that would be great. So I'm going to jump back into a question that I got, and I am going to try to clarify it on tributary area just for a second, and then we'll see what other questions people have. And then I know I really appreciate all the people that submitted questions at the beginning that have them ready to go. Hey, you may want to cut and paste those, have those ready just in case um, we need them later on. But I think there'll be plenty of time here to answer other people's questions outside. So there you go. Uh, here we go. So uh, this is a cross section that people talked about. And they wanted to know how to do the tributary area for this. Um, this is something that my students are going to use um, on their project. And when it comes to tributary area on a one way slab system, you have to decide where is the load going to go? Where is the load going to go? So this is a situation where they didn't have as many columns and they put in um, extra beams to handle uh, things like this. And in this case, you would go, um, you would start out with these beams in the middle and you would go kind of halfway in between them. Uh, we'll go with a uh, color we haven't used yet. Um, you'll go halfway in between them and you'll start to draw, like that would be the start of the tributary area. And that would go up and up and up until it hits this kind of corner and down and down and down until it hits this kind of cor corner. And what you're trying to do is trying to find where is the load going to go? Where And you can think of the load as being like, like water, where is the water gonna flow? That's another way to think about it. So you come out of this at like a 45 degree angle, you come out of this at about a 45 degree angle, and does it have to be 45? No, it doesn't, that just seems to be one that works out, and a lot of people can agree is somewhat reasonable. And then it comes down here and you come out at about a 45, and you come out here at about a 45 degree angle. So all the load in this area would go here, all the load in this area would go here, the load here, the load here, and then we do the same things over here. This comes out at about a 45 degree angle, and because of the geometry, it may be a little bit different. That's fine. And it comes this here at about a 45, and out here at about a 45, 
and then these two hook up in the center. I'll do the same thing over here. 45, 45, let's see where they meet up. Same thing over here. 45, 45, and then they go here. So again, every one of these, that should have been straight, 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 um, straight, 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 straight. There you go. You kind of get that figured out. So that's kind of how the tributary area looks. Now let's talk a little bit about what the load's going to look like on each one of these beams. So I will draw this one for this beam here, um, and we'll draw it, and I'll draw it simply supported, um, but it doesn't have to be. If this beam continues, um, well, usually you, you would assume these smaller beams, these minor beams, frame into the larger beams. So um, I'll show you how this is going to work. So I think simply supported is a fine idea. Um, for this smaller beam right here. So this beam is going to have load on it now, a tributary area that comes from both sides. So it's going to have something that looks like this. This is the load comes from both sides and puts on the system like this. Now, and I said in my video that like, hey, why not just go ahead and take this all the way to the edge? And why not just go ahead and take this all the way to the edge as well? I mean, why not? It's 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 conservative. It makes your math easier, and uh, yeah, and like we said last time, sometimes like some bad math can be good engineering. I said that last time um, in 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 our uh, live cast together. So you would get something like this, and out of this system, you would get point loads. You would get reactions, reaction loads. Now let's draw the um, the what the loads are going to look like on this beam right here. All right. <laughs> So this beam, if, if it continues in both directions like this, then maybe we make it continuous. Maybe we think of it as a continuous beam. And for modeling purposes, um, this would be a roller. Maybe this one would be a pin. And I'm not going to show what's going on over here and over here, but it goes and it, let's just say it keeps going. Just because in your project, in, mo in most buildings, these main beams usually do keep going until they reach an edge of the building. So in this situation, if we talk about what the distributed, what the loads are going to look like, um, one way you could do it would be to think of these as individual loads like this and like this and like this. That comes from the, these things. And then there is going to be point loads that comes down from here. So point loads, what? Yeah, see how these frame in? That load has to go somewhere. That load goes from here all the way down to here, and it's going to serve as a uh, point load. We'll just draw it. We'll draw it in our same magenta color here, reddish magenta color coming down and looking something like that um, on the structure. So that's what it looks like. Yeah, something crazy insane like that. And you might say, like, wow, that looks like that'd be hard to analyze. It can be. You could use a structural analysis program, or you could simplify it. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there was another trick I told you about using uh, 0.707 times the maximum value. Oh, now they can't see me. Oh, my screen is blue, they're saying. Ah, there we go. How about that? See if you can see me now. Oh, Kyle says no image. Document camera is not working. Ah, let's see here. So let's try this again. Uh, let's see, no writing. Well, that, I can see it on my screen. It looks amazing on my screen. So let's try this again. Um, first, let's close this bad boy. Remove. And let's add a camera here. And let's mute this. Okay, now let me know if you can see it. While we're, uh, let's see, still blue, still blue. So I think I just changed it. So let's see if that's uh, any better. Ah, my face and not my writing. Um, let's see. Let's see, uh, that is what I think is, ah, 
Alex says, there it is. So I think that's like whoop, right? Like whoop, there it is, right? Okay. So let's start over at the beginning. Hey, I really apologize. Thank you for trying to tell me in the chat. And I think somebody tried to call me and tell me, you know who you are. I really appreciate you. Thanks, bro. So if we have um, something like this, here's the structure here. Let me go back. I really apologize, people. Thank you for trying to let me know that that it was uh, whacked. Um, so I had, a, I had a beam system that looks something like this. And I had these uh, smaller beams that... Uh, these 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 beams these blue beams are are uh, are smaller beams that frame into these larger beams typically smaller and we try to do tributary area for all these beams so I drew a tributary area for this system tributary area for each one of the systems and I started out with this smaller beam so in the way these tributary areas this is where the load goes in each one of these systems so I started out with this smaller beam this one here and I drew the beam and I drew what the tributary area looked like on top. And then we ended up having, um, I said there was one way to, to make this simpler is just to uh, use a uniform load throughout, something like that. And then I talked about the reactions from that tributary, uh, from that beam that would look something like this. And then I came in and I said, hey, if we have a beam down here, a major beam at the bottom, and we started to look at the, tri <coughs> the tributary area for it. So I assumed it was continuous on both sides. Um, it had, had a support here, and then it looked like something like this. So this load would come here, and this load would come here, and this load would come here, and these reactions would go here and here. And now, now, apologize for the uh, blank square. Now what I ended up doing is, um, is you can simplify this if you want to. You can simplify this. Um, and turn them into their own distributed loads. Okay. Um, something like that, where the value, this value right here, would be whatever the maximum value is. We'll call that W. This would be 0 0.707 W. Okay. That, and this one would be, let's call this W2. And this would be W2, and this would be 0 0.707 W2, and this would be 0 0.707 W2. And then we would put our point loads on it like that. So that's a little that's a little messy, uh, but that is what the load would look like. Now, if you have your geometry be the same, all of these are the same down here, not, not different size triangles down here, then this is now just one big uniform load. Like So if everything was the same, then it would look something like this distributed load and again massive thanks for those pe people that came to, to visit us um, there's a few questions i need to answer for my class and i will do my best to answer your outside questions if it's all uniform it would look something like that so and uh thanks Grad Tributary Area is your new name. I appreciate it. You should use it. It's a cool name, Tributary Area. Um, and so I'm glad you can see it. And um, now I'm going to I'm going to go through and see what other questions we end up having. Um, well, there was a lot before, and uh, Great. So one question while I'm waiting for some more beautiful questions to roll in. Um, but one question we got that I'm going to answer quickly here is about can I talk about internal curing and how internal curing works? And so internal curing is a um, is a interesting concept where I you have um, aggregates that's rocks or sand that are inside the concrete and inside those aggregates there are voids um, they're usually lightweight aggregates in this case you want them to be uh, very lightweight so they have lots of voids on the inside um, and inside those pores you actually soak them and you get them wet very very wet the inside the rocks this is like pumice stone this is like 
there's clays, there's shales, there's lots of things that they actually cook in a furnace. Uh, the autoclave them to make them have these these voids um, inside of them. So you fill these things full of of water and then you cast it in beautiful concrete. So we'll just assume we'll draw concrete around the outside and um, concrete, concrete, concrete. And when you cast it inside concrete, what happens over time is the water will actually leave the pores leave the pores and it will give the concrete water to help the reaction to help this reaction help this concrete get denser and denser and denser and stronger and stronger and stronger so it cures it over time so i think it is a great technology i think there's lots of cool things about it i think the challenges though the the concerns that i have with it are that um uh you have to get your aggregates wet and you have to keep them wet. That's one challenge. Um, and that's not always trivial to do. And um, you have to know how much water is inside the aggregates. Um, you have to correct that for your mixture design to get the water cement ratio correct. And that's also not trivial to do in the field. I'm not saying it can't be done. I think we can do it. But we always have to look at our systems and say, is the, is the cost out um, or the benefits which one outweigh each other you have to always check that out so that's internal curing let me see if there's any other questions coming at the bottom here um uh, conley you look amazing so thanks for that and let's see what else we got here um yeah Kyle wants to know what for the point loads on our columns and our project, what's an expected value? I, you know, Kyle, Kyle, it's going to really depend on what your column spacing is. So in a building in general, it's just going to depend on what the column spacing is. But they can get massive, dude. I mean, they can get like very, 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 very large. And so if you have columns that are further apart, then those loads are going to go up. If you have columns that are closer together, that loads are going to go down. Don't worry. Columns are usually really, really strong and you don't have to worry about designing those. You'll learn about that coming up. Oh, here's a question. Um, what's the optimal way to mitigate a high water table encountered during construction of a pad footing? This is for a mid-rise building. So that's, <laughs> that's a good question. That's a hard one. Um, so what he's saying is um, if I am drawing, if I'm looking at a side view on a, on a construction plot and I've excavated down to pour something, yeah, we'll go back up to full screen here. And if you've got test questions or cool questions, <coughs> um, then <coughs> this is a good time to get them. He's saying if you, if you got them, if you got it uh, where you you you've dug down here and um, you encounter a water table, like you encounter water down here, like water is like in the bottom of your ditch that you've encountered to that you were going to cast your beautiful concrete structure. Well, I can tell you, this is what people do. And um, well, they, 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 number one, they should call the designer. They should call the engineer. They should call the owner. And they said, did you know the water tables this high? Because sometimes you'll have this perched water tables in, in certain areas and people just won't even realize it. But if you have this, so you should let them know. And sometimes they'll say, oh yeah, I knew about it. And I've designed for that. Or I've, I'm concerned about that. So if they've said that they've they know about it and the design is ready for it, then that's a good, that's good. That's, that's really good. Um, what you can do is you can put a pump in here, a sump, which is a special kind of pump, and you can actually pump the water out, all right? And you can dewater it and then you can cast it and you can keep going. Now, here's the bad news. Here's the really bad news. Um, that, uh, is a temporary solution because when it rains or if the water table is truly perched, it'll just keep coming. But you might be able to get the water out, then get your forms in and go, but you might not. You have to look at your actual situation of what you have to deal with and what it's all about. Now, let me tell you the best solution for this. Um, this pump is still part of the solution, but the best solution is actually down to dig down enough and do something called like a French drain. Do something where you actually dig down enough where you can put in uh, you can put in an aggregate structure, aggregates, aggregates, lots of aggregates down here. And what it does 
is it holds water. It actually pulls water away from your area. So after you've got this aggregate French drain system up here that holds your water away, then you can, you still may need the pump to dewater it, but then you can come back in and you can cast your concrete slab or whatever, set your formwork on top of it. So that is kind of the best solution if you have a high water table in whatever area that you're dealing with. Uh, uh, so someone asked me about the voids, if they're dangerous. I think you're talking about the voids for this, for the internal curing. No, um, so these voids are not dangerous. They, they, um, they may decrease the strength of your, of your system a little bit, but they will offset any decrease in strength from your system by increasing the strength of the concrete around it. So internal curing has been around for a long time and people have been talking about it for a long time. And then people have to decide locally if it's something that is practical or not. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Glad you're here. Um, they want to know um, about the questions on the exams I'm going to ask this afternoon. Yeah, I told you I'm giving a test, right? And they're they have some they have some test questions for me. Um, so no, the tests are the questions are going to come at a scheduled time, and you'll get that schedule when you get the very first question, which will be at twelve thirty today. Uh, Richard wants to know if I've done a video on self consolidating concrete, and I have not. Um, self consolidating concrete is a cool technology. And it's becoming more and more mature and able to do cooler and cooler things. Uh, but um, I haven't done a lot of work on it, a lot of research on it, and I haven't done a video on it. But maybe I'll do one in the future or coming up. There's so many cool things to make videos about that um, we'll see if SCC makes the list. And maybe there's better people than me out there to make an SCC video. But uh, maybe one will come up in the future. We'll see. Yeah. All right. Let's see. I'm going to dig back in here if there's another question back in the thing. Um, so here's a question. It says, um, and if you've got a question from my class or on the test that's coming up, then you can you can get it in. If not, I'm going to start answering some of these other questions, though. So they ask, how do basalt fibers contribute to the resistance of basalt fiber reinforced concrete to chloride penetration? So... Uh, Let's just talk about this in general. Uh, what this gentleman is asking about um, is sometimes that we have uh, we make our we make concrete beams, um, and we're worried about um, corrosion in those beams. And one of the tricks that you can use to deal with that is you can use non-steel rebar. Yeah, yeah, non steel rebar and one of them that is common or people talk about right now is uh basalt basalt fiber so basalt is like oh can't see it basalt is like the thing you dig up out of the ground and they make fibers out of it that they glue together um and it makes this uh, a version of something called FRP, fiber reinforced polymer um, uh, reinforcement. And <laughs> what these basalt fibers do is they're strong, uh, they're pretty stiff, um, and if a crack happens to form inside the concrete, then we don't worry about that rebar corroding. Man, doesn't it sound great so far? I mean, it sounds totally amazing, but here there are some problems with it. One, uh, they're not as stiff as steel is, and so then your cracks are going to be larger. How much larger? About double, about twice as large. And uh, they're expensive, but then they say, oh, but they're stronger. Yeah, that's true. But if you are if you care about keeping cracks small, then you're going to need to use quite a bit of the material. There's also concerns about, uh, about creep and about fire with these systems, and also, and, and so there's some concerns and they haven't seen widespread use in a lot of structural applications. Now, he asked though about basalt fiber. So what basalt fibers are, are again, they're the exact same type of concept. Um, they're, they're, instead of something like this though, they're discrete itty bitty fibers. So if I were to blow this up and, and 
zoom in here where we see a beam, we see crack, we see bar, and then we may need to get these. This is the big bar, big bar, big bar. And then these basalt fibers would be these itty bitty fibers, small discrete fibers that would be throughout the beam. And their job is to help keep those cracks, wherever cracks may fall, uh, form. They may help keep them small. So that's what basalt fibers are. That's what they do. That's what they're about. Um, there's other type of fibers out there. There's plastic fibers, um, which I'm a, I'm a big fan of. I think they're really cool. The stiff plastic, um, they're called macro synthetic fibers. I've got videos on that, but I have a video on basalt rebar. Um, look up FRP uh, rebar and I've got videos on fibers. So you should check those out. Let's see how we're doing here on other questions. Quantos preguntas tienen? Ah, here's a good question. I owe these people a favor. So they said, does concrete <coughs> form differently in outer space? And could it be used for space construction? Oh, oh man, what a loaded question. Um, okay, does First question, there's two questions in one there. First, does concrete form differently in outer space? So there's not been a lot of research done on this, but there has been some. Um, and my group was actually involved with some research where we were sending up samples um, to space uh, where they were being reacted and then they were coming back and then we were looking at them. Um, that work is still ongoing and we have not done a lot of our part on that on that work. But what we have seen so far from, from that testing is, oh, wrong button, is, is um, when you have cement grains, cement grains, these are little balls of cement, and then you add water to them. So we won't show the water. We'll just add water to them. Then they start to react. And it kind of makes sense that they would react – they would react around themselves, okay? That makes sense, and that still happens in space, and it still happens um, on the Earth. But um, also on Earth, what happens is, is that there's more, there's some of this reaction that forms in, in the uh, space in between. It helps better densify and fill things out. But an outer space that doesn't seem to be uh, as possible. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it just doesn't seem to be as possible. And so when this reaction starts to form, it's very, it's it's more locally forms on the surface of the cement grains in space than it does in the product in the um, water in between. And so what you do is your reaction is not as uh, uniform inside the concrete. Um, and there's a lot more work that needs to be done on this. And you say, like, how would they even know this? Well, they've, they've done experiments where they've sent stuff up, again, to outer space or to semi-zero or, min or I can't remember the words they use for it, but reduced gravity um, situations. So <laughs> then the question is, could it be used for space construction? Well, sure. Just because it's a lower efficiency does not mean that it could not be used for some kind of space construction. Now, I'll tell you the big problem, though, with concrete in space, the, like, massive problem with concrete in space is water. Okay, where are you going to get the water? I mean, just recently, we discovered that there's likely water on Mars. So you probably could use local Martian water to make concrete on Mars. But when you said space... Space means like out floating, like ground control to Major Tom, like like we're not, you know, on a planet. We don't have gravity. So where do you get the liquid to do that? Well, you could use an epoxy to glue these things together, and that's that's possible, and that's probably the most likely if you wanted to make concrete in outer space. Or you would probably make it on a planet, and then you would send it to space, Um where you're going to use it, kind of precast it. And I think that could be done if that's what you wanted to do, depending on what the application would be. So there you go. So, um, but reduced gravity concrete, um, I think is possible. I think it'll happen in the future. I think it's going to have this problem to it, 
where you may have to add other additives, other chemical additives to promote this reaction to happen here. Uh, you may have to, have to add other particles, particles that are inert, particles that don't do anything, where you start to get some of this growth to start to happen um, um, around it. There may be some other trick that we come up with to uh, reduce, I mean, to increase the gravity around this. Um, there's lots of th things that people have talked about. All right. So let's see what else we got here. Um, let's see. For temperature shrinkage steel, is there a maximum spacing? Yes. Temperature and shrinkage steel is used in a slab. Um, and the maximum spacing is about 18 inches on center. That's what the maximum spacing you can use on a slab, an elevated slab is 18 inches. And that's probably not a bad estimate for slab on grade, as in the largest distance you would ever go between rebar would be 18 inches. So we just went from, from outer space to back to earth to slab construction. So I'm, I'm talking about if I have a slab here, and if I have my major bars going in one direction and I have my minor bars going in another direction, minor bars, that the largest spacing you would ever want to use on these minor bars is 18 inches. Butimus. Ah, Alex wants to know, could you determine how you get the spacing in temperature and shrinkage deal? So, um... We talked about this in the notes. I sent this out in a comment last night as well. Um, but we'll see if we can look this up quickly um, in our class book. Um, it's, it's not that hard. It's actually no different than how you would calculate the spacing of, of normal steel. So <laughs> the equation for the same steel we were just talking about. So I'll draw it in green. The equation for that would be 0 0.0018 times B, B times H. And B, in this case, is going to be 12 inches. And H is going to end up being whatever the height is of, of your slab. There we go. I better get off this so we can actually see what I'm talking about here. Uh, boop, boop. Budao. So a number like, for example, on page 74 in the textbook that we came up with, we got something like 0.19 inches squared per foot. 0.19 inches squared per foot. That's a nine right there. 0.19 inches squared per foot. So how you would find the spacing is you would say, well, I need 0.19 divided by 12 because I'm providing... 0.19 inches squared per one foot. And then you're going to come over here and you can either pick the numerator or the denominator. You could either pick the size of bar you wanted or you could pick the spacing, whichever one you wanted to do. So if I use um, something like um, 18, because it's a number I can do in my head, um, I can, and this is the one that I end up, I end up um, solving for x equals 18 over 12 times 0.19. And so in that case, I would say this would be 1.5 and 1.5 times um, 1.9 is about 0.30 inches squared. So I would go and look up a bar that has an area of 0.30 inches squared. And that is the bar I would use at 18 inches. Um, and if it's, if I need to use a little bit larger bar, then it would just be conservative. Um, and, and again, so this type of concept and idea is very, very similar for temperature and shrinkage or for the main reinforcement, um, that could be on the exam coming up. Let's see, man. Uh, it's a good, here's a good question. Oh man, it's a good question. This is a question that drives me crazy. So while calculating the effect of shear stress on the plastic moment capacity of an eye section, <laughs> why do people use uniform stress even if they know it's not? Okay, well, we'll answer this question really quickly. Um, and so if I have a member, this is very, very, very much more common in steel than it is in concrete. But if, if I have, and this is why people do this, because of steel. If I have a, something like this, um, and I was to draw what the shear stress diagram looked like, the shear stress diagram. 
So usually you you con you freaks out there, not necessarily concrete freaks, but you structural engineering freaks know that the, the stress distribution for shear is documented by VQ over IB. If this thing, uh, and so what, what happens is if you actually draw this and you actually figure out what the stress diagram looks like, it would be small here and then it would be large and then it would be small here again. Um, and say, well, wh why is that? Well, you're used to when, when you did structural analysis or when you did strength of materials, they, they had you do things on uniform cross sections, things that were uniform. And so when you drew the, um, the shear stress diagram for that, you drew it to look something like this. So that web is a uniform. So you're going to have a parabola or something like this for that web. And then you're going to have smaller amounts of stress in, in the top. You say, well, why is it smaller? Well, it goes back to the B. What's the B? It's in the denominator, isn't it? So if the B is large, that's this dimension and this dimension, then it's going to shrink whatever contribution this would have to the shear stress. That's what the math tells you is going to happen. And you actually can measure it. And that's what actually happens. But that's not what you asked me. You said, why do people make it uniform? And I'm not a big fan of making it uniform. Um, and, but what you can do is you can take this parabola and you can turn it into an equivalent uniform stress. And that's what most people do. And they use V over A. And it's not a horrible estimate, but I, I don't like it. I think it's wrong and I don't think people should use it. And my class knows that. I've told them about that already. Um, all right. So what else we got? Development length. Is there a reason besides space to use a hook bar over a straight bar? So this is just for if people who are just tuning in. So if I have a wall or some, if I have a beam that I'm framing into a wall of some sort or, or an, another column, let's say something like that. Um, I need, and I, I need to actually make sure that my concrete or my, my steel has enough strength at this spot. And so I use something called development length there. What development length is, is that there's a certain distance after the point of where I need it, that that bar has to extend. So if that bar tries to get pulled out, it will resist, it will resist, it will fight, it will try to resist. And there's a whole cool video about this, about worms. Yeah, worms, it's all about worms. Okay, watch the video, you can learn more. Uh, but Kyle asked, um, in development length, is there a reason besides space to use a hook over a straight bar? Um, yeah, sometimes there is, Kyle, um, because it's not just about space as far as um, getting things to fit. It's also about this dimension here, this dimension. Okay, sometimes we want this dimension to be smaller. So that's one reason to use it, I guess. And then another reason to use it is just um, congestion, having lots and lots of material in here that you just want it to get get it to be used. Um, other than that, a, a hooked bar and a straight bar provide the same capacity. They provide the yield strength of the bar at the point um, of development. And um, there you go. It's pretty much about space. Um, and if you don't want to use a hooked or a straight bar, you can use something called a headed bar where the bar actually comes in and it actually has a head on the end. And again, that, that will anchor the bar and hold it in place and keep it from uh, breaking out. That's what that's all about. Oh, man. Oh, Tyler wants to know about this bridge. Actually, I actually know about that quite a bit. Our West Seattle bridge, I mean, uh, Douglas has been sending me emails. Douglas, I don't know if you're on the, the, the thing or not, but uh, thanks a bunch for those emails about this. Uh, there's this West Seattle bridge recently closed for two plus years due to significant fractures that may lead to failure. Any opinion on whether it can be repaired and how? Thanks for your time. Oh, my gosh, Tyler. You're asking a loaded scary question. I'll try to answer it very, very um, shortly and simply. Um, and hopefully it gets to the point. Um, I should do a video about this, but I want to wait until I learn more about what's going on. So on this bridge, what it is, is it is a trapezoidal box girder bridge. So it looks like this in cross section in, in plan view. Um, this is a post-tension segmental. You know what that means. This is a very cool type of bridge construction. Um, and for the time in the 80s when it was built, um, it was a, it was a, um, it was a, 
a good move, a bold move for that for that part. Not it hadn't been done a lot of other places before then. Now, if my eye was on the side looking at this structure, it would look something like this. Now, this whole thing, Rihanna, you asked a question before about post tensioning and concrete around steel wire and things like that. That is what exactly what's used in in this type of construction. Um, so what I see, what I see, and doesn't mean it's totally real. I haven't seen everything about it, but what I see is that there are some some very, very large diagonal cracks in this structure, very large diagonal cracks, and they're getting worse over time. Um, they're getting larger and larger and larger. So uh, that that is not good. Um, and and so you can definitely fix this. You you can. What you do is if you know where the cracks are going. That means that there is tension in that direction, tension in that direction. And the way to fix that is to come back with a repair technique that actually uses steel that's applied in this direction. I probably should have used um, a different color there, but you would apply steel in that direction. You would actually post tension retrofitting. So you'd have to come inside. You'd have to go inside the structure. You'd have to apply steel that on this wall that is at a diagonal that is perpendicular to the cracks. Yeah. It, doesn't it sound hard? Doesn't it sound expensive? Doesn't, I mean, yeah, yeah. Like, and actually they may not have the clearance. They may not have the room. They may not have, I mean, there's just a lot of like tough. It's really, really tough. Um, and you could put something on the outside of the structure to try to, to try to hold it together or, or uh, fix it. But one of the big problems with that is that you don't necessarily know um, how long that will last. You don't really know how long that will last, especially in the environment, especially where you've got a lot of uh, a lot of salt and other things around you. I'm trying to fix my light here just a second. Then that that may be end up being a problem. All right, back to the questions. Um, what else we got here? Somebody asked me, am I familiar with conductive concrete? Yes, um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you can embed uh, lots of different, uh, lots of different metallic materials inside concrete. Um, sometimes you can use fibers, sometimes you can use, um, uh, steel bar themselves usually fibers are, are most commonly uh, but or, or you can use a, uh, a um, this happens sometimes on slabs where they'll put wire inside of it some kind of wire inside of it um, and they'll usually use it to melt the ice on the slab but that i hope that's what you're talking about or what you're thinking about and and so yeah i know something about that stuff and it's pretty cool um, and it can be used it's very expensive um, and sometimes they'll use it to try to make concrete um, conduct electricity, or sometimes they'll make concrete where it actually blocks outside signal. So if you want to build like a bunker or a house where people can't send signals inside, then that is a, another technique or approach to to uh, to do that. Uh, I can block that. Yeah, it's not working out so well. All right. Oh man. Let's see, we'll answer this one right here. So in a basement design of a multi-story building, how would you tie the concrete walls to the columns to ensure water tightness? Well, concrete um, in general does a pretty good job of keeping water tight, uh, keeping water out. So what I would, my main concern would be uh, just try to use fibers, try to keep those cracks as small as possible and think about where you think it's gonna crack and try to attack it there. That's what I would say. But a bunch of questions that like popped up. Um, sure, Chaz, if you got some questions, you can email it to me. Let's see. Let's see. So he said 75 centimeters. I think I said 75 millimeters, not centimeters millimeters that would be three inches um to protect passive layer of steel so i was wondering if there's any kind of reaction between the basalt and cementitious matrix to form a layer ah 
No, um, no, there's no reaction as far as I know between to form um, some kind of passive layer. That passive layer, if you watch the video about it, is caused by iron oxides hydrating. And um, since basalt's not made out of iron, then um, that doesn't happen for it. Let's see. Let's, uh, um, here's an interesting question. Can you explain how concrete behaves exposed to sub-zero temperatures like minus 150 degrees Celsius? Wow. Um, that's an interesting one. Um, I, can I can tell you that the reactions totally stop in that, in that kind of um, uh, cold environment and but other than that i think it's fine i know there is a sub in the arctic in the united um that that people definitely use um a lot of concrete and that's a big it's a big study for them and i don't think there would be a problem in minus 50 150 degrees celsius but you know you never kind of know until you do it and play with it maybe you know something that i don't let me try one more thing here with this yeah, it didn't help. Okay, so what else we got here? Um, how would I ensure the load paths are followed from beam to column and not beam to basement wall? Um, I, I wouldn't worry about that. I, I think load is gonna is gonna follow stiffness and if you provide multiple paths of stiffness, um, then there's usually no concerns with that. So you need to have at least one path that works. And if you have multiple paths, then that's fine. And you can watch a video about structural resiliency that I've made if you wanna learn kind of more about that. How does that, uh, I don't know. Is there any application of, ah, here's a question. Um, is there any application of inelastic analysis in everyday engineering practice? Inelastic analysis. Um, so, hey, first of all, thanks for the compliment. I really appreciate it. And thanks for attending the live cast. So is there, the question was, was there any examples of inelastic analysis in everyday analysis? Um, uh, yeah, um, well, with seismic, there is. For sure. And we actually use a lot of an inelastic analysis. We just make assumptions that make it a lot easier. What you'll find is um, inelastic analysis in extreme events so, or in for, forensic analysis is, is, is extremely valuable. But we actually don't want our structures to go inelastic um, in everyday, everyday applications. But there are some certain applications when we do either use inelastic or, or, and we're using it and you don't even kind of realize it. Um, so I would say not a lot. Right. Okay. So this question is talking about, why don't we use, I think he's talking about the steel one. Why don't you use steel plates with uh, three bolts from both sides? Well, um, <laughs> steel plates are great because um, they are stiff which is awesome, but steel plates will only, will allow those cracks to stay the same size. They will not um, make the cracks go smaller. They will not um, make the cracks close. So if those cracks are already large enough where they're losing connection, where they're not doing a great job of, um, of actually transferring load, then a steel plate would, would hold them and maybe transfer the load um, um, across that. And you'd have to see if the steel plate had the capacity or what thickness that would need to do that. Then you brought up the other key point. How would you hook the steel plate to the concrete girder? Well, if you're going to use bolts and go through the girder to try to hold those cracks um, smaller together, then um, those bolts will be exposed um, to the environment. And, and maybe that's a good solution. Um, also, these are usually like 18 to 20 inches thick. Um, and you're going to have to drill through them to put the steel bolts in. And you're going to have to do a lot of holes. You're going to need a lot of holes in there. And you're going to need to protect all of those bolts. So, yeah. That's tough. At some point, you have to say to yourself, is it just cheaper to tear the bridge down and build it a different way? Uh, let's see. 
Let's see. Can you speak about anchorage of rebar on the longitudinal axis to the column associated with the moment and axial diagram and anchorage on the top of the column? Man, there are lots of different questions there. Um, I, I think this, the simplest thing I can tell you on that, on, on what you're asking here, and we're going to uh, maneuver just a little bit over here to um, you're talking about a column coming down terminating in the ground and then we need to anchor the steel there so as a structural engineer you may look at it and think of it like this or you may look at it and think of it and use a hook something like this you could do it either way at candy cane these are two discrete bars not the same bar they're not connected um, you can do it either way, and you usually design for maybe some kind of load coming this direction. So in that case, this would be in tension, or it would be coming in this direction. Now, I'm not saying you would use both of these. That's not what I'm recommending and not what I'm saying. I'm saying you would use either one, whichever one happens to be best for your application. All right, so my son is coming up through the window here. So I'm going to see if there's any other questions. Uh, here's a question. Why the freezing temperature in freeze-thaw testing is suggested to be minus 20, 20 degrees Celsius? Oh, man, that's a great question, a great loaded question. I'm going to try to change my document camera here just a little bit and see um, if I can get this, get out of the, out of the, uh, there you go. Oh, look at that. Look at that like a champ. Um, so why do we do that in the freeze thaw test is, is, is what the question is. Um, so I, I don't think that freeze thaw test, if you actually see and you're talking about the, um, well, most freeze thaw tests are the ASTM C666. You had the devil's test. Um, that what, why does it go to minus 20 degrees Celsius? I think they just had to pick a place where, um, water would expect it to be frozen. And that was a temperature where they thought that that, that would be where it was. Um, there's actually doing a lot of research on that, and um, hopefully you all be able to talk more about that in future videos. Let's see. In terms of durability in a desert climate such as Arizona, would you recommend steel structures over concrete structures of a building? How do they compare in terms of durability? Okay, Manzer. So in if we're talking about buildings themselves, I'm not that concerned about durability. Um, I'm much more worried about uh, where water pools, especially um, in Arizona. So in inside of a building, I'm not that concerned at all. Um, and I, I don't, as far as the building goes, I don't think concrete for steel really matters that much. I think um, if you're talking about bridges, if you talk about roads, if you talk about parking garages, I think that's where they start to matter a lot more. Yeah, Chaz wants to know, is there a maximum amount of fly ash to cement mix for the best concrete? So Chaz, no, um, there's not some maximum amount. I've seen mixes with 80% fly ash. Yeah, 80% fly ash. 20% cement do amazing, amazing things. You have to get the right uh, fly ash, though. Um, and I've seen things where 50-50 do great, and I've seen things where 20% fly ash and 80% cement are more needed. We're doing a lot of work on that concept right now and keep your eye out for videos. I know I've been doing a lot of videos for my class, but there will be some videos talking more about classifying and understanding fly ash coming out. Oh, here's another one. Wow, man, here's a great loaded one. Why don't we have more concrete roads? Ah, uh -huh, ha, ha. Um, you know, the simple answer I would give would be that a uh, state, a uh, city, whatever, a county, have a certain amount of money and they want that money to go as far as they possibly can. There's also a lot of contractors that are in those regions that may have expertise in building an asphalt road and so they want to keep building an asphalt road. What I'd recommend is that the bids be put up side by side comparing concrete to asphalt and let the contractor choose which ones they think are best for the best cost. Um, remember that you're not going to get the same per, um, performance out of a concrete road versus an asphalt road. And so you need to take that into account somehow or you'd like to take that into account somehow. So, But if you set like I'd like 40 years out of this road and this is the number of trucks that I want that this road is going to see or traffic this road is going to see, then you can do a head to head comparison. And that's what a lot of people are doing right now to compare these. And if they do, I think some places you'll see more concrete where there's heavier loads. 
and you want longer life. And I think places where there's not as heavy loads and you don't want as longer life, then, then asphalt will be um, the choice. Great. So, ah, uh, Air Crete question. Yeah, Air Crete is coming. Um, I've got a lot that we've done in our lab. I've had with the COVID-19, I've had to put some of that work on pause and had to focus on um, teaching my class. But there's an Air Crete video coming and there's more stuff coming out on that. And I think there's some good things about Air Crete, but I think there's a lot of challenges with Air Crete. And I'll talk about that in the video coming up. Oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah. So a question here about uh, what blogs, websites, etc. do I recommend to staying struck um, up about um, learning about structural engineering? So I, that's a great question. Um, I am much more of a people person, so I try to go to conferences and I try to learn from people. I have a large number of networks and contacts that I talk to. I go to a lot of meetings where I discuss those things and that's kind of how I stay tuned in to what's what's going on and see what, what people are, are, are up to. Um, as far as blogs go, I don't know of any good ones. I know, and that's one reason why I started to make videos is because I wanted to kind of fill that space and try to help out with that. Um, I do know um, um, Intelligent Concrete, they have a very nice video blog and they talk about a lot of really, really cool things. Um, I know um, I know that uh, there's other people out there in the space that are actually trying to do different things. Um, I'm just not as aware of some of the things that they're doing. So but thanks for the question. So I'll go back and answer this. Like, I'll give you my take on this one here. Um, so when we use limestone powder with expansive illuminate materials, so I think you're talking about either a calcium illuminate or a tight case cement to replace cement. In some cases, there are new phases. Yep. Micro and hemi carbo illuminates. Yeah, that's true. I don't think a lot of people know a lot about them. Um, and it's bound instead of monosulfo illuminate. And I think truly these phases have been around for a long period of time and, and, and they're around in Portland cement. We've just not studied them recently until we started adding and looking much more about using limestone filler. So um, I think then he qu quotes, he finishes it where he says, how does that stabilize AFM? <coughs> so I don't know. It's a short answer. And I don't think a lot of people out there in the world know how it stabilizes it and what it's all about. So I think that would be something that um, we should study. I know that um, we've got a little bit of work in this area that we're working, but we're mainly just looking at what characterizing what phases form. Um, yeah, I think you have to understand that first before you can ever understand how they're stabilized and kind of what they're all about. So that is something that maybe you can work on and you can share the world, tell, tell the world about what you found. So the question is, um, yeah, there's lots of good stuff about UHPC, ultra high performance concrete. Why is it not penetrated the market more widely? So, my take on this is that ultra high performance concrete is amazing stuff um, for certain applications. It's kind of like anything in life. You have to find the right application for what it is that you're trying to do. And um, I think that while it's good, while it's got some benefits, I just think it's too expensive. Now there's a huge push around the, around the world try to make it less expensive and try to do new things with it. And I think there's good applications for it. Like if you're going to use a closure pour um, for a structure, I think that's a, that could be a, um, a good application. If you if you want something that you want really, really good durability, um, and uh, then, then perhaps that could be an application. Perhaps that could be a, a good application. But I think that there's other ways to get very similar performance with um, a lot less expense. And so I think that's why people have not pushed for UHPC and maybe we'll see it more in the future. There's a question about self-healing. 
What about self-healing of concrete? I think self-healing is a very, very cool concept and idea. I think it shows a, a lot of potential. I think that there are problems with it, though. I think that when you look at what typically forms when you have self-healing concrete, and this is a concrete where you have a crack that's formed. So let's go back to the beam I was talking about before. So I have a beam. Boy, the, the sun is just causing me challenges today. I have a beam, and it has a crack in that beam, and I was to zoom in, that crack looks something like this. And what, what the concept is, is right on the surface of the crack, there's unhydrated cement grains. There's cement grains that have not reacted all the way. And those cement grains could fill in that crack over time. That's the concept. So oftentimes when you analyze the material that fills in that crack, if you, fill, if you actually analyze what's there, you'll find that it's calcium carbonate, largely. Calcium carbonate. Let's see, yeah. Calcium carbonate. And that calcium carbonate is not CSH. It's not the good stuff. It's not the stuff that really keeps concrete tight um, and together. It, it is like a filler. It's like a limestone. But yeah, that's what forms there is some kind of calcium carbonate. Because calcium hydroxide forms there and then it, it gets carbonated by the CO2 and that forms the calcium carbonate. And that's what ends up filling the crack. So it's like adding a bunch of little bitty pebbles to the crack. Does that really help? It probably helps some. But I don't think it helps as much as having CSH there. So that's what I think it is. That's at least, then there's the stuff where they have the the um, the bacteria inside the concrete, and the idea is that when the concrete cracks, it like breaks open a vial that like wakes up the bacteria, and the bacteria starts to come alive, and they start to fill up the the the, the cracks. I think that's a cool concept, um, and people have tried to do that. Um, I think there is a problem with that though, that once that bacteria becomes alive and it starts filling up cracks, it'll fill up everything. You might say, well, isn't that a good thing? Isn't that what you want? Well, sometimes we use something called air and train concrete, where we actually stabilize bubbles inside of concrete on purpose. Um, and so if I have a bubble over here that I need for freeze thaw durability, how does that bacteria, once it's woken up, how does it know what's a crack and what's a bubble? It doesn't. And actually research has shown that it will fill in, it'll fill in those, uh, those bubbles. It'll fill in the air and train bubbles around it as well, just as well, just as well as it fills in the, the, those cracks. And now you don't have a place for the water to expand to, uh, to go to once it starts to freeze. And that, that, that's a big deal. That's actually, uh, so you, you would fill in the crack, but you would lose long-term freeze thaw durability. Let me try to fix something else here really quick with my light. I'm going to try to do this. Yeah. I killed it. Okay. So I was self-healing. Uh, oh, man. So many more questions. I guess there's no more questions from people. I have 47 people. I've got 20 thumbs up. That's amazing. Um, so we'll, we'll keep going here with some of these questions. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I talked about self-healing there. Um, characteristic. Strength confused by percentage of samples. I don't understand. Um, yes, yeah, Simon wants to know, can you design a self-consolidating concrete mix without super plasticizer additives? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think there's a way to do it. I don't think you're, you're going to get the flow because what super plasticizer does is it disperses your, your, your um, cement grains and your fly ash and things like that. And I don't see how you would ever do that with um, without some kind of super plasticizer. Uh, so he asks about nano nano add mixtures such as nano silica, et cetera, becoming more popular due to their small size and high reactivity. How important is the mixing stage? Yeah, I think it's extremely important. I think understanding these materials, how they change your rheology, how they change your, your mixing energy. Anytime you add small materials, you have to shear them, you have to disperse them. That is a big challenge um, that, that these things are going to have to face. And so that's that's a big deal. So I am to the end of my questions that people have asked me that I have shown up on my stream. I know that sometimes they come in in clumps. If you have questions, 
I will go back and answer a few at the beginning. But then after that, if you have any questions, this is your time to get them in. If not, then I can pay out and move on here. But I got some really cool ones. Um, let's see. I answered the basalt one. Oh, man, I can't like there's a lot that I can't see now. Oh, well. I can only go back so far in the questions. Huh. I got some questions really early that I uh, maybe you've asked me them already, but um, I don't see any more on my on my thing. Answer that one. Uh, let's see. You know, I'll go back to this one on this 150 degree, negative 150 degree Celsius question. And I'll, I'm going to put this out, out into the world in case. I hope there's people still here. Um, there's, a, there's a cool story I'm, I have for you on this. Um, so in my class, every year in my concrete mix design class, we actually do a, a, uh, a design uh, competition. And um, it's for highest strength. Sometimes it's for best durability. Sometimes it's for something else that we wanted to do. And in this case, <laughs> we were doing highest strength. And it was, we, I would, the mix design was fixed, but then you could cure the concrete however you wanted to. Actually, you could do whatever post treatment you wanted to the, con to the concrete to make it as strong as possible. And there was a group that did something very interesting that if people are paying attention to, you may be able to figure out how to take advantage of this because I've always wanted to figure out how to take advantage of this and I've never quite figured it out. Um, <laughs> what they did, there was two separate people independently came up with this concept, um, at least I think they were independent, um, came up with this concept where they would take their concrete um, uh, beams or I, th I think there were cylinders. They took their concrete cylinders. Um, they threw them in a bucket of water, right? And they left them in in water for, uh, I, you know, uh, several days. I think it was six days or so. And then they um, they took the concrete out after six days of being inside water, and they like immediately froze it. They took it to like as cold as they could get it. Um, and you said, what? Why would they do that? Wouldn't that damage it? Wouldn't that hurt it? I mean, because it wasn't air and train concrete. Wouldn't that do something to it? Well, what they did is they they took it to a um, very, very cold temperature, um, and the ice formed inside of it. Ice crystals all formed inside of it, and they actually tested it cold. They tested it frozen, and all those ice ice crystals inside of it all aligned and all made an inner structure inside of the concrete to hold it together. I mean, it was unbelievable. Like the machine, like when the concrete broke, it just like, like explosive, like things going everywhere. I mean, it was like unbelievable how it broke. I think it increased the strength by about, I think three times, something like that. Um, and so this idea, talk about a very inexpensive way to increase the strength of your concrete. And so this minus 150 degrees Celsius, if your concrete is wet and it freezes, it will get stronger, a lot stronger. Now, you have to make sure it survives and isn't damaged by the freeze-thaw cycles, but it will get very, very, very strong because of all this micro-reinforcement that goes inside because of the ice. Now... Maybe we could use this in space. Maybe we could use this in lots of different applications. I don't know. I think it's a cool concept. I think it's a cool idea. And I'm putting it out into the world to see what you guys can do with it. Let's keep moving here. I don't know what he's saying here. He's Nick Hill's asking about is it the percentage of samples or five percent of the load? I'm not sure what you're talking about, man. 
Are you talking about fly ash replacement? Ah. Uh, she wants to know as a concrete <coughs> negative effect on our body. I think that means like do you if you eat it, is that what you mean? Or if you touch it, if you're close to it? Um, so concrete is um, alkaline inside of it. So if I was if I were to if this was my um, member and if I was to go inside of it, inside the pores of concrete, it has um, it's the same consistency of, of Drano, like Drano, you know, the stuff you use to clean out your uh, toilets. So kind of caustic, kind of bad for your skin. But on the surface uh, of the concrete, um, that it's carbonated. So the carbon dioxide comes and reacts with that. It actually actually sequesters carbon dioxide, but not enough to, to matter. On the, on the surface, though, um, it's neutral. So it, it doesn't hurt you. You can touch it, do whatever you want with it. Now, um, so it doesn't hurt, hurt your skin. Um, it does when it's wet, but it does not when it's, when it's hardened, um, at least after some time after it's hardened. Now, um, but when you eat it, it would be, if you did want to eat it, then, then it would be like um, a rock. It would be like eating a rock. So I wouldn't recommend it, but I don't think, I mean, it depends on the size of the rock, but I don't think it's going to have too bad of an effect on you because we eat all kinds of things like calcium carbonates and other things in our, in our food that are in a certain inert mineral fillers and they don't really hurt us. They pass right through us. So as long as it's not too big, then it, it probably wouldn't hurt us. Uh, pre and post cracking stage of fiber reinforced concrete. What's the question? But yes, they exist. They're all about it. And um, I think pre cracking, um, I, it depends. You need to better define what pre cracking means to you. Um, maybe we'd say early formation of cracks. Um, then fiber reinforcement is really, really cool. I'm going to have a video coming out about that. I hope, fingers crossed, we've done some awesome research on this that I think will really open people's eyes to that. And then post-crack. It depends what you mean by post-crack. How big of the crack? You mean like end of life type stuff? There's a lot of data out there and a lot of work that's been done on post-crack as in really large cracks that happen um, inside fiber reinforced concrete. And and fiber reinforced concrete works great in both these applications. We've got really good data on these early age cracks and on the, uh, a lot of data already exists on the larger size cracks. Now, the, when the cracks get really large, in my opinion, I don't think they help as much. I think they're much more valuable on the, when the cracks are very, very small. At least that's my interpretation of your question. Oh, uh, hack. How do you explain, how can you ensure proper dispersion while using nano admixtures? Well, you can first sonicate them before you even add them to the concrete. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sonicate them. Yeah. Put them where you have a, a sonicator that, that moves the particles as far apart as, as they possibly come. Uh, can they form actually micro bubbles on the surface? At least that's, that's what I've, I, I've read about it. Um, and so get it dispersed before you even add it to the mixer. And you might say, that's not practical. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, you can also use, once you get them sonicated, there's certain um, certain surfactants that you can use to keep them far apart from one another. And that, that can help them perform well. That's a challenge. Then in the mixer itself, you wanna have really, really good mixing energy. But I think there's a lot of people that think that, that the mixing energy itself is gonna create enough energy to, uh, disperse those things. And I haven't seen that in, in my work, but maybe you guys have, um, know something that I don't. So why does high strength concrete failure more brittle than normal concrete failure? So what, um, Kali and think, Hey, Kali, I've seen you before on, on my live cast, man. And I think you've sent me some other things as well. I really appreciate all your help and support. Um, if I have stress and I have strain over here, um, what Khalid is saying is that if I have high strength concrete, as my strength gets higher and higher and higher, then it goes up and up and up and up and up. And if I have low strength concrete, it looks more like this on the stress strain curve. And what he's trying to say is, why does this happen? What 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 is this all about? Well, um, let me try to give you my best answer. When you use high strength concrete, usually the best way you get it is you use a lower water to cement ratio. And a lower water to cement ratio 
means that my cement grains, it's kind of like if you saw me talk about space concrete. Yeah, space concrete. Talked about space concrete in this video. Um, we talked about these um, cement grains and what the spacing was between them. Now, this is what low water to cement ratio concrete looks like. And this, oh, I can't see that either. And this is what higher water to cement ratio concrete looks like. They are further apart. That's really the big difference between them, um, believe it or not. And when they start to hydrate and form, and they start to form their microstructure, um, so the connections here are not as strong in the higher water cement ratio than they are here. Um, and so when these things fail, they fail much more easily. There's not as much energy that's built up there. And so they pop, 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 pop. They unbutton more easily and they lead to this lower stress drain diagram. Now, in, you have a lower water cement ratio. Not only is it, you're, are you failing these connections, which are much stronger, but sometimes you actually fail through a grain. Yeah, you actually have to go right through one of these cement grains. And break it in half. And these cement grains, the unhydrated ones, yes, there's lots of unhydrated cement grains. Even in concrete that's really, really old and been in water a long time. When they break, they're very strong. And it takes a lot of energy to do it. And when they break, it's sudden. They pow, they pop. It's much more sudden. And that's why there's much more. It's stronger. But there's much more energy release. There's much more damage that starts to happen. And that's why when they do break, um, it's, it's much more brittle. Um, is silica gel a hazard? I'm not sure. Uh, why aren't hanger bars taken into account when designing a single reinforced beam? Minimum amount of steel. Oh, you should watch my video, Simon. I've got a video all about that on doubly reinforced beams, um, and you should watch it. And it basically shows you that the amount of increase in capacity that you get from including those compression steel is minimal, like less than 5%. So it's just not worth it. Watch the video. Uh, another question. This is a good one. Um, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to shut off here in eight minutes or so, eight minutes. So if you've got some questions, it's time to get them in. Um, why <laughs> we have to consider creep in reinforced concrete design. Oh, man. So creep is a problem because it's constant deformation under a constant stress. So there's a there's a couple ways when it becomes a, a big deal. Um, and the biggest way, let me change my camera here a little bit. The biggest reason why is that if I have a very, very, very tall structure, let's say a big, big, tall structure, and that structure has columns in it, right? Lots of columns. And those columns are highly loaded. That's very common. Oh, can't see it. Those columns are highly loaded. Highly, highly, highly loaded columns. Because people want very wide open spaces. And they want to shrink those columns as small as they possibly can because they get in the way of stuff. So when you have these things under high load, then they will shrink. Now, if I have differential shrinkage, so if I have a lower load, a lower axial load here than I do in the center, I will get differential shrinkage in my building. I will get more shrinkage in the middle than I will on the outside. You might say, well, does this real? Does this really happen? Well, yeah, it really does. And the taller the building is, the bigger this is much this is a much more bigger of a deal in a tall, tall buildings. Because even though there's not that much deformation, they deform over a much, 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 much larger length. So you can get differential shrinkage of inches, inches on the top stories of buildings between the inside and the outside just caused by creep. This can cause all kinds of weird cracking to happen inside, um, weird serviceability issues. This can cause... Um, windows on the outside of the building to pop out and fall below this is a big deal and i should probably make more of a video about why this is such a big deal and thank you for that idea i'll write myself a note creep okay seven minutes counting down or less than that
this curing compound a good alternative to traditional curing in dry environments? I don't know what traditional curing means. Um, do you mean wet curing? Um, so there are times when curing compounds are useful. There are times when wet curing is useful. Um, and so you need to kind of figure out what you really need for the long-term performance of your structure. I've got lots of videos about this. You should watch them. Um, maybe they'll help. Oh, said that one. I don't understand, Pavan. I see your question about replacing, rep, replace coarse aggregate by this. What's going to happen? Will it be positive? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Replacing it with what, man? Asking one question here. I already answered that. I have not used this sodium polyacrylate. I've not used it for um, internal curing for um, for concrete. I, I I'm a little worried if it if it would or how long it would hold water. Um, but is that no? That's super absorbent polymer you're talking about. Um, so super absorbent polymers are very very cool, and I think they're a really cool idea. They're used out of diapers. Um, and I think they can be used for um, um, internal curing. I think there's some good things that they can they can do for them. I think they're better than lightweight aggregate. I talked about lightweight aggregate and um, internal curing earlier in this video, and I think they have the same problems as that. So I don't know. Hanger bars do not contribute to the minimum cross-sectional requirement for that. Yeah, I think... I think you're talking about for AS min. I think you need to look up why AS min is is derived. AS min is derived based on um, keeping once a crack forms for your structure not to fail instantly. So that crack would form on the tension face, not on the compression face. And so it's you know they have very very low efficiency. So that's why AS min. You need to look at. You always need to go and look at why these things exist the aci commentary sometimes gives you lots of information sometimes textbooks will give you lots of information of why these different criteria exist and what they're trying to um, design against and that may give you some help with that man all kinds of stuff going on here it's just going nuts people heard i was leaving and then and then hey call it thank you brother thank you for attending um people are just starting going crazy for 5G era concrete. Man, I'm not sure what 5G era concrete means. Oh, you're talking about like the, what would you say for 5G era concrete? I, I think um, <coughs> you're talking about keeping out oh, signals and how the signals are, are, are going to change, what that's going to be like. You know, I don't know. That's not something I've studied a lot about. Is FRC advisable for retrofitting concrete building structures is a, is a question from Albert. Um, it could be. Um, yeah, for sure. I think it depends on what your application is and, and what you need that FRC to do. Um, and, and you're saying fiber reinforced co uh, concrete is what I'm what I'm anticipating um, you're saying there. I think if fiber reinforced concrete, need, if you need to keep the cracks small in that area, or if you're if you're worried that concrete is going to crack and you want to you want to keep that small, then then that is something that that could be valuable. You just have to look at it, what your application is. I, I'm a big fan of FRC if you want to keep cracks small. Uh, Harry wants to know, um, hey, thanks for for saying thanks, brother, um, to the head of reinforcing bars in a recent video, do you have any intuition on how they would affect shear transfer across construction joints? So if I have a construction joint, um, and you might have been the one that asked me about construction joints before, Harry. I don't remember. I've talked about them on previous live casts. But if I have a construction joint, that means a cold joint where I'm actually going across from one, one place to another. Harry wants to know how can I anchor my get an anchorage in. So usually you know when you're going to have a construction joint. Um, so you could, in a sense, put a headed bar here, 
and you wouldn't have to go back as far into that other concrete. So this is, you're building, you're building, you're building, you know you're gonna end, you put a headed bar construction joint in, and as long as this distance is large enough to um, activate the bar, to anchor the bar, I think you're asking, is it going to be good enough? At least that's how I'm interpreting what you're saying. And the answer, I, in my opinion, will be fine. Yes, it will be fine. There could be something I'm not thinking about, but as far as I'm concerned, it will be just fine. And that will be a fine thing that you could end up doing. Now, one thing to watch out for with headed bars that people actually don't talk about a lot is that if I have, um, now if my eye is above looking down and I have a whole series of headed bars in a row, whole series of headed bars in a row, people don't talk about this but it's real, I've seen it in testing. Um, a whole series of headed bars in a row. What can happen is these heads um, can create a weak plane inside the concrete and you can get a cracked form right along here. I've seen it, it's happened. Um, and I don't know if they're gonna address it eventually or not. Um, headed bars are pretty recent um, in the code, but I think eventually at some point um, they will if they become more, more popular. And as far as this stiff, the pullout, man, they're, they're the same. Um, there, there's no difference in, um, they, they'll perform the same. The goal here is that you don't even know what's on the left-hand side if you do the, the thing right. Everything, it doesn't matter whether it's straight, whether it's hooked, whether it's headed, whether it's got a candy cane on it, it doesn't matter. Um, if you design it right, at this point, they will behave the same. They will be the same. That's the goal with a headed bar. Uh, Hilti anchors, man, there's been a ton, ton of work on Hilti anchors. Hilti anchors are widely used. They're powerful. I'm not sure what you'd want to test. Um, or expansion, epoxy and expansion anchors, also extremely cool stuff. Um, and they, they are, they, they are great. Um, how do you, the pile is cured. I think you're talking about pile like in the ground. They don't cure them, man. They don't cure them at all. They're going to get great curing because they're going to be surrounded. So I'm going to do some rapid fire answers here on these last ones. So we'll go from there. Um, oh, you're talking about grid dimensions. I think you're talking about <coughs> the breakouts and things like that for anchor bolts. Um, think, I, I think you're talking about like if I have, I'm drawing a top view. If I have a, uh, a structure like this and um, if I have something on the side, um, you're talking about like, do they break out like this breakout, this, this like breakout strength, like, like this. Yeah. That, that's a big deal that, that needs to get worked on. Um, and I think the biggest deal on, on, um, those anchor bolts are, are installation are getting them in the right place or were they, were they built correctly? And if they're built correctly and done correctly, I think they perform well, but you're right. Anytime you get these things near an edge, They'll start to behave um, strangely, and you have to think about them. So I, I see where you're coming from, and I think you're right about that. I'm, I'm going to go back on what I said before. There's been a lot of work done on these things, but I agree with you that there's much more that needs to be done to try to figure these out. Um, and so I would say get involved. Bring up what these questions are. Document them. Um, share what your real big concerns are and what you see in the field. That feedback is drastically needed for people to figure out what the true questions are so they can go in and try to answer them. But you're right. I'll go back on what I said before. I think you're right. There, there's been work done, but there are, there are some of these things that that still 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 need to get figured out. Uh, I don't know. Uh, right. Oh, for temperature cracks. Yeah, hanger bars, man. Um, those are hanger bars are usually used in in beams, not in slabs that I know of. And if they're discrete bars, then they don't really help you that much. I think that's another thing. Um, yeah, there is a metric equivalent of the ACI code that 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 exists. Um, it's not widely used. It's not widely adopted and used by lots of people. But you can you can get an, a metric version of of the ACI manual. Hey, man, thanks for the compliment. I appreciate it. Uh, mustache, indeed, mustache. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. Could you mix concrete with bones and reinforce it with steel and make it a lot better? You mean like full bones, like big old pieces of bones? Do you mean ground up bones like they make with bone china? Um, because there's, you know, I don't know, I don't know, ceramics that have been used with bones for a long time. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about like big discrete bones? But either way, I don't know if we know reliably what the strength of bones are. So how do we take that into account in our in our designs? If we're putting something in that we're not sure what the properties are. Yeah, yeah man. Yep, avoid flat roofs. Thank you, Ms. Fa, for answering. Um how to evaluate the buckling length of a column in a building associated to stability, the brace length. Watch my steel videos. I have a whole ton of steel videos where I talk about this in great detail. Okay, a lot about buckling. I go in depth about buckling to answer this question. Hey, thanks so much for attending. And you do need the radius of gyr gyration and the slenderness ratio. That's true. That's part of it. But you also need the end fixity or the K factor. That's important as well. Um, <clears throat> answer that. So, yeah, he just wants to know, hey, what if I have 60 um, KSI steel for my main steel and, and 40 KSI for my ties? And is there any <laughs> impact? I don't know. I, I wouldn't worry about it. I think the stiffnesses are, are, are going to be the same. I think you just have to take take into account the different strength, for the different design criteria. I think you'll be fine. Oh, yeah. Ground bones. <clears throat> So ground bones, so sure. Um, people have looked at ground bones as additives to ceramics. I don't know anyone that's looked at ground bones to additives for concrete. But even in the ceramic world, they've gone away from using ground bones because they just can't get them um, in the large enough quantities that they need. So they've gone to minerals that they can mine or other things that they can synthesize instead to give them the same um, um, abilities. Now, one of the reason the bones are helpful is they fire them. And that changes the structure. And I'm not a big, I'm not, I, I know enough about that stuff, but I don't, I don't do that stuff all the time. I'm not so sure that they would help that much. Um, appetite, I think is the name of that, of that material. If it would help that much in concrete, but I don't know. You should try it. You should let me know. I'm always learning and trying new things and always, always fascinated about what's going up. So um, here we go. <clears throat> that I think with bones is a good way to end it. We went from outer space to back to earth to outer space to frozen concrete to basics of reinforced concrete design to complicated concrete materials. This has been a fun ride. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I'll be here again next week. And uh, this has been a blast. Take care, everybody. And we'll let the Pixies play us out. Thanks. Times of craziness. Where is your mind? <laughs>